Shall we start? Hi. <laughs> I think we should start. We have a long discussion ahead. Could you please take a seat? Okay, thank you. Thank you everybody for being here around this uh, very interesting subject, shaping supply chains of the future. Uh, we're so happy to see the room is packed. It shows it's an uh, important subject. So we're gonna start with the first round table, which is um, quite an amazing round table because you have here uh, leaders from the business sectors, from NGOs, and also from the research world. So um, I'll start with you, Pascal. So Pascal, you're the executive vice president in charge of a strategic resource cycles at Danone. Then we have uh, Tony. Tony, you represent here the research world. You're the director general of the World Agroforestry Center. Barry, Barry Parking, you're the chief sustainability and a health and well-being officer at Mars Incorporated. And last but not least, Manoj Kumar is the CEO of Nandi, uh, which is one of the biggest non-profits in India. Manoj will tell you a little more, a bit more ab about uh, Nandi. Um, Barry and Pascal, if you agree, I might start with you. And Barry, what would be nice is uh, maybe if you could explain to us what it means for supply chain in mass. What do you buy? From whom? And also to let us know about the changes uh, occurring in the supply chain at the moment. Sure, delighted to. Uh, can we move the chart along? Somebody there? Are we doing it? You want to go back to Tony? I've, I'm sorry, uh, Manoj is telling me we need to start with a research organization. So Tony, maybe if you would like to start. <laughs> they can find mm. the chart. Mm. I like this, in the meantime, they can find the charts. <laughs> could I still use Barry's slides? <laughs> <laughs> Tony, would you like to maybe stand there? Or you're more comfortable here? I'm happy here, yeah. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a delight to be here, and what an exciting session in, in amidst this era of, of climate change, sustainable development goals, and the, the world situation in which we find ourselves. I'm a scientist, and so uh, with the indulgence of the organizers, we're going to start with an experiment, okay? And we'd ask, uh, the panel don't have to, but could everyone stand, please? <laughs> and this is not so that others can steal your seats. So we're just going to have a small experiment, okay? And this is voting. It's a new type of voting. You don't vote with your heart or your head or a ballot. You vote with your backside. And you only have one backside and you only have one vote. And so you sit down when you agree with a statement. So could we ask everyone in the room who would describe themselves as a capitalist to sit down? Okay, let's soften it for you, make it a bit easier. <laughs> Could we describe everyone in the room who would describe themselves as somebody who likes to maximize and optimize returns to capital to sit down? Okay. Could we ask everyone who would describe themselves as somebody who likes to maximize and optimize Returns to natural capital, returns to social capital, and returns to financial capital. <laughs> and we'd like to ask those people who didn't understand the question to also sit down with me. <laughs> so we're all capitalists. We just don't like being branded as, as them. And that's why it's such an exciting session. And, and to, for myself, as a leader of a research and development organization, you know, to share some insights of why we would like to collaborate with the, with the private sector. But you know, how are you working on public goods and reconciling those with 
private interests. Surely there's a bit of a clash there. And it's exactly this type of bias that we want to address this afternoon, whilst keeping some independence and, and healthy scepticism. If we think of public goods and publicly derived goods, it doesn't have to mean private bads. And if we think of private goods, that doesn't have to mean that it's a public bad. And it is that, that reconciliation of public goods and private interests that we need to explore as we engage with private sector and business. Now, as you all know, agriculture is the largest employer in the world, the largest single land use in the world, and the human enterprise that is going to be most affected by climate change. And how as public sector actors and private sector actors and individuals are we going to address that? And how are we going to address it together? Now, the fact that the majority of the 500 million smallholder agriculturalists that we have in the world, the smallholder farmers of the world, our subsistence farmers is a disgrace. It's a moral embarrassment. And so, if most of you agree that our theory of change is to go from subsistence agriculture to subsistence agriculture plus safety nets, to pre-commercial agriculture, to profitable agriculture, to sustainable agriculture, how can we ignore the private sector in that? Or are we happy that people stay in subsistence farming. We have many public-private partnerships financed by public sector, and the majority of those address SMEs, the small and medium enterprises. Because surely the multinational corporations, and we have a, a few here, can look after themselves. Why do they need a subsidy? Why do they need extra special treatment? And yet, we have great opportunities of co-investment, co-location, co-engagement. And that's the big prize. It's not the few extra financial dollars we might squeeze out of uh, multilateral funding agencies. So my understanding of the private sector is, is for a long time, they knew that they had to keep their customers happy. And then they evolved to realize, well, but not only are your customers happy, but we've got to keep our employees happy because they need to be engaged and we don't want to be training a new crop every year. So let, let's keep our customers and our uh, employees happy. But now there's a realization, well, it's, it goes beyond that. It's also about keeping our suppliers happy and our partners happy. And it is that realization, that enlightened self-interest from business that is helping uh, them reach out to engage and also being more amenable to engaging with others. The landscape approach, and this is the Global Landscape Forum, is not going to work with the single sector or with a single commodity or with a single stakeholder. How can we have sustainable coffee production from the same farms of unsustainable cereal production or unsustainable dairy production? It's not going to work. And as the theme of this meeting says, it's all connected. And so all of us with enlightened self-interest, we need to reach out. We need to engage. We use different language, and, and the public and private sectors have different vocabularies. But in the way that, that NGOs and, and scientists want to scale up, business wants market expansion. The cost-benefit ratios to scientists and economists equate to the risk-reward ratios of business. And it's about linking that sustainable production with sustainable sourcing and sustainable consumption that we all need to work towards. So if we are to fix that broken smallholder agricultural subsistence model, what is it we need to do? If we are to link public goods with private interests in a better way, what is it we need to do? And if we're trying to accelerate the impact of sustainable production, sustainable sourcing and sustainable consumption, what is it we need to do? What is it we need to change? Because it's not about pointing fingers, well, you need to change and you need to change and you need to change and wouldn't it be nice if you changed as well? We all need to change. 
We need to engage. We need to challenge each other. We need to trust, because that is a key part of public-private partnerships. And we hold, need to hold ourselves and others accountable. Because quite frankly, our beneficiaries, our employees, our partners, and our clients all deserve more from us. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Tony, for such an interesting introduction. Um, Barry, shall I turn to you now? Um, in a company like Mars, uh, a supply chain, what does this mean? What do you buy? When we spoke, you told me you, you are buying from more one, um, than uh, one million farmers. What is changing at the moment? Could you explain a little bit? Yes, delighted to. Second attempt. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. and uh, Great to be here. Um, if we could move the chart along one more. Where am I? Aha, uh -huh, here we go. Keep going, Leonie. Thank you. So yeah, let's, let's get practical. What, what does a food company like Mars' supply chain look like? So this just give you a bit of a sense. So you all know Mars. We're a chocolate business, a pet care business, a main meal food business, a garment mint business and a drinks business. So we sell all over the world, but we also source from all over the world. And uh, we source more than 100 different sorts of raw materials from uh, 50 or more countries around the world. Now, many of those raw materials are, um, they're all produced by farmers. Some are produced by uh, industrialized farming, much of that in the Northern Hemisphere. And those are the tractors on here. Um, but, but actually, most of our um, materials are produced by smallholders. And uh, we estimate that we have around about a million smallholder farmers in our supply chain that we source from. And contrast that with the 500 uh, uh, million Tony talked about. So we have quite a number of smallholder farmers. And uh, to Tony's point, many of them are um, uh, at the subsistence level. We're not happy about that, and that's why we're doing something about it. But just to give you a few examples, so if you take uh, the chocolate business, then uh, you can't make chocolate without cocoa. Cocoa comes from West Africa, and uh, much of it, and we've been working extensively there for four years to, uh, to, to develop a model where we can transform the farming. And what we've, what we, why we're optimistic about this journey is we've already demonstrated that this is possible and that you can massively improve the yields and therefore the livelihoods of farmers. Another couple of examples from this chart, if you go around, the, uh, our Uncle Ben's brand, based on rice, a lot of rice from Southeast Asia, and uh, we're working there with farmers in that region. Mint, much of the world's mint comes from India and uh, supplies our mint products, our, uh, our gum products. Coffee and tea. Much of the tea comes from Kenya for our drinks products. Smallholder farmers all around the world. If you took any food business in the world, it would look something like this. So we, there are lots of smallholders. Now, one of the challenges is that we don't any, own any of those farms. In many cases, we're two, three, four steps from those farmers. So we have to drive change through our influence through the supply chain. And that's what makes this uh, challenging, but also, I think, uh, means that we have to work in collaboration with many others. So why are we doing this? I'm sure you're asking. You know, what is the motivation for a company like Mars to tackle smallholder farming and to, to, to move them along that journey that Tony talked about from smallholder subsistence farming all the way through those stages to ultimately sustainable farming? The motivation is twofold. The first one is there's the moral imperative that Tony talks about. It's just the right thing to do, that everybody in our supply chain can be successful as we are successful. The second is that it's just good business. We know that if the farmers at the start of our supply chain are not being successful, they'll try and do anything else. They'll try and get into other crops or they'll try and get out of agriculture. And that's not good for our business. So there's a very straightforward mutuality here. If we are not able to make the farmers at the start of our supply chain successful, they'll do something else, and that's not good for our business. So 
That's what's exciting, and I think more and more companies are recognizing that. There's not only the moral imperative, but there's a the great business imperative for tackling this, and that's why we're here today and talking about livelihoods. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. <laughs> Pascal, it would be nice if you could uh, share with us what's uh, maybe let tell us a little bit more about Danone and what's going on in your supply chain yes. and explain your drivers. Are they the same as the one driving the transformation in Mars? Is it strategic reasons or more reputation challenges? Thank you, uh, Christine. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So yes, I mean Danone is a is a food company. Uh, it's another food company. We are um, involved in the different businesses: uh, fresh dairy products, uh, water, um, infant formula, and also medical nutrition. And uh, when you hear that list of products, obviously you you understand that uh, soil, agriculture, water are key for us. We depend on this, or more precisely, we depend on sustainable agriculture and healthy water cycles. Um, you probably, if you were in the amphitheater uh, a few minutes ago, you heard uh, Emmanuel Faber, our CEO, talking about uh, the, the commitment that we have made when it comes to climate, uh, where we said we want to become a zero net company on our full scope. Uh, and he said the full scope is beyond what we control. And uh, actually, the full scope is made of uh, um, mostly, I mean, 51% of that is coming from uh, uh, the milk farmers uh, from which we get our milk every day. Um, and, and therefore, you know, again, sustainable agriculture is really uh, at the heart of uh, uh, what we need to do uh, also to achieve this uh, extremely high uh, ambition. Um, our fresh dairy division works uh, with uh, 140,000 farmers. Uh, we, we collect actually 7.5 billion liters of milk every year in 40 countries. Very, very different situations, obviously, in all these countries. Uh, but 80% of uh, the, the milk uh, suppliers that we have are smallholders. They have less than 10 cows. And, and many, many of them, once again, are exactly in the situation that uh, Tony and Barry uh, described earlier. Uh, they struggle uh, from an economic point of view, from a social point of view, and also from an environmental point of view, uh, as we could say, because of you know, their, their limited knowledge uh, having direct impact uh, on uh, the environment. So uh, why do we need to, to care about that? Simply because the resilience of uh, Danone uh, depends on the resilience of these farmers. I mean, this is, we are directly in contact with them. We get our milk uh, every day from these people, and, and there is no way uh, that we are going to uh, survive, uh, strive in the future if, we, uh, if they, they are not resilient. So that's why for many, many years we have been working, uh, trying to kind of find solutions uh, in a very modest manner, huh, to, to, to be frank. It, it's a very complex topic and, and, and we are all trying to, um, to, to move that forward. So we have done experiences through um, an initiative that, that is called Danone Ecosystem Fund. Uh, for the last five years, we have uh, uh, had initiative in more than 20 countries, uh, working with small groups of farmers, uh, working in terms of uh, we, with partners, uh, that's very important. It, it's a joint effort between NGOs, uh, between very often uh, government authorities, between uh, with civil society, with experts, uh, trying to help these farmers to uh, develop their knowledge, improve their practices, uh, which has directly an, an impact on uh, uh, the volume they can produce, which increases the quality of their milk, uh, which in turn has a direct impact on their income. So that would be for the economic uh, dimension. But as soon as their uh, situation, economic situation improves, we see a social improvement. Uh, it's about empowerment. It's about uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the impact on, the, on the strengthening their jobs and, and, and the fact that very often women also uh, found a very uh, strong position in these uh, farmers' families. Uh, and the last point is also, uh, by improving their practices, we have an impact on the environment. So, that's very important for us to continue to have this uh, three, uh, so triple win to a certain extent, economic, social, and environmental. Um, however, you know, 20 uh, countries, uh, projects, we call them labs at Danone. So lab means it's, it's still a small scale. 
So the challenge that we are facing right now is how do we move that to the next level? Uh, how do we scale it up? Um, and this is one of the evolutions that, that we have uh, uh, in the short term at Danone. We are changing our organization. So we are moving from, uh, and you have probably seen on the, on the screen the, the, the little uh, move of, uh, from chain to cycle. Uh, and that symbolizes uh, a different way of looking at things within the organization. Uh, a cycle here is about uh, optimizing the way we use resources, uh, regenerating, reusing, recycling. Uh, and, and this is uh, very important uh, to do it all together. All together means all the communities living along our cycles. At Danone, we have uh, obviously milk and water are part of uh, this essential or, or strategic cycles that we manage. And, uh, and this is a small farmer calling. Uh, <laughs> And this is a, um, a very important element. This is a massive change for, for our organization, um, simply because, and this is a change of mindset. Uh, and, and there are three um, critical points here. It's about being collaborative. Uh, collaboration is at the heart of uh, the, the ways of working on cycles with the communities along the cycles. It's about alliances. We are fully convinced that we cannot do that alone, and we want to leverage the experience that we have had in the past with NGOs, multiple partners. And it's also about the fact that it has to be open, open from a governance point of view. We want to be influenced by people, uh, some of them being here in the room, uh, who can you know, really challenge the way we do things in order to achieve uh, um, kind of significant improvement to scale it up. It's going to be a journey. We have to be very humble. Uh, we think that this is a, a way to uh, move towards a bigger impact, but there is a lot of work to be done. Uh, but at the end of the day, the prize is quite interesting. It's going to be the resilience of uh, uh, these farmers, and that's going to build the resilience of Danone. Thank you, Pascal, and thank you for being transparent on the challenges. Before turning to Manoj, uh, Barry, would you like to explain also the challenges that you are facing in this transformation? Yes, yeah, sure. I think I think the first challenge is obvious. It's just the sheer number. Um, you know, within our own supply chain, sourcing from towards a million farmers. That's a million farmers you've got to get to individually. Many are not organised in any way, and that's just a huge challenge. And that's just it means it's going to take some time. Um, they're also hard to reach. Uh, many are um, uh, you know, in remote places and uh, without great infrastructure, and therefore it's essential we partner with, with governments in order to do this. Um, and I think the third, the third reason is also sort of obvious in a way, in that because they're living on the edge of uh, uh, subsistence, they have nothing to invest. Everything that they produce just goes to subsistence to survival. So therefore, we need to prime the pump. So you know, let's not walk away from the fact here that this is going to require massive investments from, uh, uh, from the corporate world alongside all other partners in order to do this. And uh, Emmanuel talked about it in the plenary. Uh, clearly, this is going to take a big investment from Damone. It's going to take a big investment from Mars. Uh, and that money needs to work alongside the, uh, the non-governmental non and governmental uh, uh, funds in order to make this happen. So we're, we're in it for the long haul, I think, here to, uh, to make this successful. Manoj, I'll turn to you now. Um, we all want to hear the point of view of the NGO. Uh, I think it would be interesting if you could uh, share what Nandi has been doing, especially with farmers in trying to connect them to the market. What are the challenges and the key factors? And also, um, what do you expect from the private sector? Thank you. <coughs> That's a handful of questions. Um, first of all, I want to thank you that I'm feeling at home seeing the crowd here, you know, including the cell phone in disruption. <laughs> um, very much at home. And secondly, I just want to clarify that while I represent as Christine rightly introduced, the largest nonprofit. When it comes to farmers, I'm fully for profit for them. So please make this distinction that I'm speaking for the for profit of the farmer rather than 
nonprofit organization that I represent. So in a line, um, we are down by a scale of um, 10 when it comes to comparing with Mars and the number of small farmers they work with. We work with around 100,000 farmers all over India. Um, and in terms of purely direct work, and therefore it's much significant compared to the millions of farmers that Mars works with directly, and that's a far more challenging job and you know far more unbearable. And I can imagine the, the extent to which um, the challenges would spread across regions. Uh, we have broadly three large regions in India, all agrarian stressed regions. One is the mountains of Araku, where there are landless farmers or tribals, where we have the largest farmers working with, uh, which has been supported by a number of uh, private companies world over. Then we have uh, central Maharashtra, which is one of the most challenging places, again, for agrarian distress, called Vidarbha. And we are also in what was touted as the Green Revolution Belt of India, called Punjab. So all these three places we work. And I'm trying to represent the farmers, especially the small farmers. Almost all the farmers we work with hold own either no land or less than two hectares of land. So I'm trying to speak on their behalf. And the first thing that I want to share with you is the fact that farmers all these places face one fundamental challenge. They do not understand the concept of p &L accounts. They do not understand what is profit and loss. And this is really something that we learned the very hard way. Farmers are comfortable just understanding cash flows. As long as cash comes to their system and they spend it, they're absolutely fine. Uh, they do not realize that they could be in cycles of debts, cycles of losses, and cycles of failures, but they feel absolutely OK as long as cash comes and goes. And one of our biggest challenges working with them was to teach them p and in a manner they recognize. And as you talk to them, of course they know the p and But the conditions are so tough that they wouldn't want to acknowledge it. So our challenge is to use the p and as a framework, profit and loss as a framework, to discuss what are their input costs, what is the output that they get, and can we go beyond just discussing yield and prices, uh, which is where the whole conundrum works. And when we do this, we have to then discuss how, how can we take them to the markets. And the more we discuss this, we realize that there are two fundamental challenges. One, we need to change the farmer's mindset on just producing something, just harvesting something, and hoping they'll get the best price in the world. It's a huge transformation of convincing the farmer to understand the idea of quality. And it, it, it takes an effort of proving to them, demonstrating to them, that you will get a higher price, you will get a higher profit if you have higher quality. It takes, it takes a certain conviction, it takes a certain um, sustained partnership with the market, read uh, private sector for that, for this farmer community to believe that it's worthwhile investing in quality. Because very often, it's about an extraordinary additional detailed investment in not just the crop selection, not just the way they harvest the crop, but it starts fundamentally from how they deal with the soil itself. And so if you are looking at the soil to harvest the whole chain um, for quality to enhance, it's tremendously la greater amount of hard work. And that cultural shift itself is a challenge. The second challenge we have when you want to talk to the farmer is mostly about seeing how they can go beyond just producing the raw material, and how can, they, how can they be part of any other valorization? Can they be in the next level of processing? I, I often quote the example of something like basmati rice in India. You know, a farmer typically gets something to the effect of five rupees a kilo. And when you buy it, the cheapest price you can get in any store in India, it is 180 rupees a kilo. And those of you who have any familiarity with rice, you know, it's, it's not rocket science to shift from paddy to rice. You know, it is just one intermediary process. And it takes 175 rupees, or a multiplier of almost 20 is something that beats any economics that I've learned. So the challenge is, how can you allow 
farmers to be part of the next value chain. And the partnerships that we have been able to forge with private sector world over, and I should tell you commendably both in India and Europe, has been to see how we bring this farming community in large numbers to be not part of just the bottom end of the supply chain, but to be partners in actually the value creation. And if you do that one level of promotion of not seeing them as supply chain participants, but next level of the value chain, I think that's when the trust deficit really happens uh, to reduce and flip over. And farmers begin to trust the private sector because it's imperative that we have a lot to tell the farmers, uh, to, to aid the farmers in a manner that is enterprising. And I want to end by saying that what really uh, amazes us is that the world is full of business stories which are so successful. And if you study them, most of the businesses that are successful in the world are family businesses. And if you see, the largest number of failed family businesses are small farmer family businesses. I mean, this is the biggest paradox in economics. Both have the same <coughs> principles. And I emphasize this because it's important we change our lexicon to keep thinking farmer not as an alpha male. But farmer <coughs> is fundamentally about a family. There is nothing called a single individual farmer. And the challenge is how can we translate the <coughs> principles of successful global family businesses to small farmer family businesses. And if you bring in that transformation of bringing in the idea of profit, the idea of involving them in the next value creation chain, you will find that we will convert the farmer from being an aid recipient and fundamentally aid recipient of politicians and governments world over, more than the private sector. They're just made as pawns for political games. Instead of that, if you will be able to convert a farmer to something like a farmer entrepreneur. Maybe somebody will figure out a term to combine the two and give a new word for it, and I don't mind doing that. But that's the transformation we are looking for. If you do not do that, to paraphrase what Tony did in the beginning, they will vote with their backside. They will actually walk away from farming, and we will have to probably end up eating pills. I hope that they won't happen with more and more of the changing landscapes, I think farmers will end up becoming, at the base of the pyramid, a phenomenal story of successful family businesses. And I hope that would also translate to families sharing profits within themselves. Women getting control of what to do with the disposable income. And women making those decisions that this disposable income will be invested in health and education and such needs, maybe for water and sanitation, rather than a masculine way of dealing with disposable incomes. If this happens, I think we have a bright future. Thank you. Thank you, So, Tony, what would be your advice? Where, in there's obviously lots going on, where do you think companies and NGOs should focus on? Great, thank you. Thank you, Christine. Um, eight quick pieces of advice from, from a research and development organization. Um, but firstly, congratulations. Um, congratulations to all of you for choosing the best parallel session this afternoon. <laughs> and secondly, congratulations to you for staying right to the very end. Well done. OK, eight quick pieces of advice. Um, Understand the private sector motivation for partnering with you. Because if you don't understand it, you're not going to succeed. And be honest about your own motivation about why you want a public-private partnership or wanting to engage. Secondly, don't be afraid to ask the tough questions. But ask the tough questions in a friendly way. Because they're exactly the same questions that business is asking, but they, they're, they're very used to the confrontation and, and the, the disconnect, it is still framing the question with a view of, of solving it. Respect different ways of working. Uh, the private sector world is different from a publicly funded uh, private uh, um, research and development organization. 
try and understand the different vocabularies. They're there for a reason. The difference between evidence and hypotheses and assurance and profit and loss and risk and rewards, etc. They're there and understand them. And you will find synonyms, common words, in your own disciplinary uh, lexicons. With the private sector, um, be prepared for performance orientation, driven metrics, few easy quantifiable things that are a proxy for all other things. That's a key, key feature that, that we had to go through. Be willing to let go of, of some of the caveats. Scientists love caveats and conditionalities and nuances. We've, we've got to be sharper. Business ask us, will it work or won't it work? How much will it cost and how can we make it cheaper next time? Seven, don't crumble to the private sector. They're not superior, they don't know more, they're not better. You've got to stand up rigorously for what you are confident in, but also be prepared to compromise if there is, there's a strong argument posed back to you. And lastly, as I mentioned in the beginning, to help debunk those biases. Now, scientists are a funny bunch. They're like a bunch of thoroughbred racehorses. You know, they really run well on the day, but they bite the vet, they kick the stable boy, they knock over the food. Very difficult people to manage, you know. They want to argue, they never want to conclude, they don't live in the real world, and so why the hell would private sector want to engage with them? And scientists look at the private sector in the way some of those people didn't sit down in the first way of, well, this is a, you know, rapacious pursuit of profit and don't care about the environment and just out for the money and it matters to shareholders and they talk about triple bottom line but it is only that single bottom that, that you had uh, at the very start. And so that debunking those myths and seeing where you have much more in common than you do apart. And so where we've been successful in adding value is firstly is helping to better identify and manage and share risk. Because that's a, that's a key aspect of, of any organization running, but also a business. Technical support. Um, our own organization has 210 Boffin PhD scientists. And those have tremendous amount of knowledge. And in the past, we used to be providers of knowledge products. And realizing with the private sector, we're turning now into providers of knowledge services. And that's a key change. And lastly, that robust and reliable and cost-effective evidence and monitoring for, for reassurance, for compliance, and to drive efficiency gains. And I think, to conclude, Christine, it would be we've got to reimagine extension, getting those knowledge products and knowledge services out to the small-scale producers. It's not going to be the public sector. When, when I went to Kenya 21 years ago, there were 14,000 publicly funded government extension offices. Today, there's less than 3,000, and they're getting smaller and smaller. And they don't have vehicles, and they don't have fuel in the vehicles, and they don't have resources. And so what's that private sector, what was that extension officer of the future? It's likely to be the input supplier, the service provider the artificial insemination person, the, the person who's running a small tree nursery. And not only do they want to sell more seedlings, they want to have the after-sales care. They want to be able to go and help the people identify markets. And they'll be more successful in their business if they're using technology, particularly IT. And that's a great opportunity for youth because they've seen their parents' drudgery. And they don't call their parents farmers, they call them expert weeders because that's all they do all day long is weed their fields. And they want to see a business, they want to see a future, they want to see something together. So I think private sector and public sector get together. We can reimagine extension and turn it into an enterprise, turn it into a business for the good of all. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. And <laughs> thank you to, to you all. I think it's um, impressive to see the power and the impact of a coalition of actors. I'm sure you do have questions, but you'll get the chance to ask the questions after the second round table, because we are going to now have a look at two field examples, one from Guatemala and the other one from Kenya, starting with a little film.
Guatemala, a tropical country in Central America, is known for its rich natural beauty. On its Caribbean coast, we find one of its most famous biodiversity treasures, the mountain Cerro San Gil. In the Maya tongue, Guatemala means the land of endless trees. But its landscape has drastically changed. 60% of forests has been destroyed due to cattle ranching and intensive agriculture. Environmental degradation has impoverished the local communities that depend on this land for their livelihoods. To reverse the damage, the investment fund Livelihoods, in partnership with the NGO Fundeco and the Guatemalan government, is carrying out a large reforestation project that will plant 5 million trees. Il faut travailler euh, simultanément la conservation de la nature et le développement communautaire durable. On ne peut pas faire l'un sans l'autre. For generations, farmers here have planted only corn, which has eroded the soil. To restore the land's fertility, Livelihoods is converting farmers to agroforestry, the system of intermixing trees with crops. All the plants are provided for free. They are cultivated in nurseries, which help create local employment. It's beautiful. Se trabaja en grupo, tanto hombres como mujeres, valemos por igual. The project teaches farmers to grow both food crops for consumption and cash crops to increase their revenues. Guatemala's tropical forests are ideal for growing cardamom, a cash crop. Cardamom oil produced from these seeds is expensive. It is used in cooking, aromatherapy, and even in perfume. El cardamom tiene es rentable porque ahí anda mi trailer, que que ahí anda mi trailer de cardamom lo compré. Livelihoods and Fundeco aim to help smallholder farmers like Husto better market their products. On the Pacific coast of Guatemala is a company that will buy cardamom seeds from project beneficiaries in the future. Eliza and her husband John Marie started their company to produce 100% natural essential oils. Nelexia buys cardamom seeds directly from smallholder farmers to ensure better value for the producing communities. Pour nous, le développement durable, c'est quelque chose qui doit être à long terme. Donc, on plaît, ça nous, il nous plaît énormément le projet Livelycous parce qu'il nous permet vraiment de construire des relations à long terme avec les communautés de cardamom. Guatemala is the world's number one producer of cardamom seeds. Livelihoods is helping large companies sustainably transform their supply chains while protecting the environment. The COP21 will recognize the link between environmental degradation and rural poverty. By addressing both, the project in Guatemala will improve the food security and livelihoods of thousands of smallholder farmers. Let me introduce our speakers now. We have here uh, Wangu Mutua. You're the Deputy Regional Director for the NGO V Agroforestry in Kenya. John, John, I must apologize. There was a mistake on your name uh, on the first slide. So you're not John Kumar, but you're, uh, <laughs> you're not uh, Manoj Kuzin, but you're John Getty. And you're the director of the milk procurement at Brookside Dairy in Kenya. Then Marco, you saw Marco in the film. Marco is the founder of Funda Eco in Guatemala. And Dominique, Dominique Rock. Uh, is um, the head of natural sourcing at Firmanish, and you will tell us a little bit more about Firmanish. 
Uh, Marco, shall I turn it to you? We'll start with Guatemala after this uh, beautiful film. Could you please um, tell us the changes that are going on right now in Fundaeco and also why and how you are trying to build more and more bridges with the private sector? Well, yes, uh, the first thing I should say is that Fundaeco was, was really a conservation organization. We're thinking about protecting biodiversity, protecting the natural forest. So, of course, we very soon realized 20 years ago that uh, you cannot protect an ecosystem it, if it's surrounded by people that are in poverty and, uh, and are very hungry. And the second thing we realized is that agroecosystems, the agricultural landscapes around natural forests, are also very important to protect biodiversity. So we started looking beyond the forest in order to work with farmers and in order to identify uh, ag agroecological systems such as agroforestry to uh, support families and at the same time recover ecosystems, recover forest trees, forest cover and biodiversity. So, so that was the, the, the first change. The second one, very important I think, was scale. We NGOs love uh, pilot projects and research projects and we love to try new things all the time. And deciding on a system, uh, Tony said forget caveats. Uh, deciding on a system, betting on a, an up, on a productive system and going to scale was the second huge challenge. You know, we, you, we used to plant 200 hectares a year, now we're aiming to plant 1,500 hectares a year. Of course, as you can imagine for an NGO, that also implies huge institutional changes. And I think that's, as, uh, uh, when I came here to Paris, I was thinking of a message to be delivered to my friends and colleagues, and I think it's capabilities. We had to learn to build institutional capabilities. We had, and I think that's something that both donors and investors need to realize. There aren't that many NGOs that have the necessary capabilities to plant 1,000 hectares a, a, a year. We weren't such an NGO and had to learn and develop these capabilities. So that was a huge change. The other one was culture, institutional culture, going from distrust in the private sector to actually learning to work with them, becoming friends with them, and trusting uh, each other. And, and I should say that we had a very important thing happen in Guatemala, which was that we created an alliance with uh, uh, the Non-Traditional Exporters Association, AGEXPORT, which has a development program. So they were from the private sector, but they understood development language. And I think that that helped us because they are a member organization of private companies. And I think AGEXPORT did a great role in helping us do this step to cross that bridge between NGOs uh, and the private sector. And I'll, I'll leave it at that uh, at this moment. Thank you. Dominique, um, could you tell us a little bit about Firmenich and also why you think this example we saw in Cerro de San Gil is uh, particularly interesting? And also, it would be nice to share your key learnings from engaging with smallholders in Guatemala and in other countries. In less than two minutes, or? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Firmenich is, uh, is a Swiss company, privately owned, uh, and our business is to create and manufacture perfumes and flavors, so some of you may be familiar with this, and others not. Um, to do this, we source uh, uh, roughly 180 natural ingredients throughout the world, uh, from 40 countries, so there's quite a diversity there. Um, and this is, 90% of these ingredients are based on small farming. Uh, doesn't come as a surprise after what has been said. And uh, we estimate that 200,000 um, farming families are supplying this, uh, this portfolio. Um, what I want, what I'd like to give you as an example is that maybe uh, a little bit differently from the food industry, what we do um, is <coughs> extremely diverse. We source uh, very commodities, well-known commodities, uh, citrus oils or mint oils, and we source the most incredible products that I, I doubt many of you have ever heard of. Uh, I don't know if some would be familiar with LME gum from the Philippines or Peru balsam from Salvador. Um, and each one has just the same importance. So this is, this is what ends up in the company at what we call our palette. Our palette is, is the colors, is the, is the scents we give to our perfumers and flavorists to create. 
So this is our own challenge around biodiversity. And the big question, the question that we feel responsible for is what's going to become with this palette 15 years from now? If, we, if the palette relies 90% on small farming, what happens if small farming stops producing some of these specialties? What happens if, uh, if the Indian pickers don't want to pick tuberose anymore and there's no more tuberose fields? It means that uh, tuberose has been around for uh, over two centuries in, in the perfumeries. It could very well disappear. We have examples where it's disappeared. So it's a challenge. It's a challenge, and this challenge, we feel we have to face it with uh, knowledge and involvement. Uh, for a long time, our industry, I, I often say this, but it's true, has been lazy. It's, it's easier to have supplier relationship, buyer and supplier, than to go in uh, 40 different countries to investigate each and every supply chain and understand what's happening in the field. But if we don't do it, uh, it's absolutely sure that this palette is gradually going to disappear. So we feel a great responsibility for that. And to connect with the example in uh, Guatemala, this is exactly what we're trying to do. Uh, cardamom is a, is a wonderful product. Uh, most of the cardamom goes in the Middle East uh, to be chewed or to be used in cooking, but 10% of the cardamom seeds are used uh, in perfumery, and this is the most incredible scent. I hope uh, many of you will have a chance to, to smell it. Um, so we need cardamom. So we're, we're like with many other products, we're faced with this decision. And, and we have to be very, very clear on that. We, as the cardamom oil buyer, we hold the market power. So it's our decisions. What do we do with this market power? It's, it's easier to sit in this office and wait for a drum of cardamom oil to reach uh, the warehouse and just discuss the price. That's the easy way and that's how it used to be done. Another thing is to try to understand who is growing the cardamom at origin, what part of their revenues is this growing representing, is that a good revenue, is it uh, sustainable, do they wish to keep planting and, and, uh, and collecting it or is, uh, do we have problems? So this is exactly where we need the two people that you've seen in the film. First, we need a producer, a producer in Guatemala who knows what he's doing and with whom we can very surely say, we don't want you to be a supplier, we want you to be a partner. And, and this is not only about words, it's a reality. Like, if you're a partner, I'm going to prefinance you and I'm going to commit to your product for several years in advance, and this is key it's very key because only if we do that, then the producer Nelixia, which you see in the film, can turn the farmers into partners and commit to them. And this is the virtuous link that we're trying to create. And only if we succeed to do that with us, the creator and the market owners, to the producers and then on to the farmers, will we succeed in preserving first the livelihood of this um, communities, and second, the future of these products. What we want is two things. We want 15 years from now to be sure that cardamom will still be on our palate and that the children of today's cardamom growers will still want to plant it and to crop it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and maybe I should add that uh, there are, I know there are many co NGO colleagues in the, in the audience that NGOs, we do have an asset, and sometimes we don't even realize it. Fundaeco had been working in this region for 20 years. We knew all the producers, we knew the communities. We had organized local associations of producers. We, are, we have been organizing cooperatives. And this is something I found out very recently that interests companies, because it helped them secure uh, stable supply chains, and it helps them, in a word I just learned a, f a couple of, a few months ago, traceability. Now companies want to know who is producing, how the product is moving, and I think we NGOs that have been working in the field for many years have this asset to bring to the table. And the other one, which is also for my colleagues in the audience that are from NGOs, is that we're also thinking about our partnerships with, with allies and our own sustainability. In the case of Nelixia, we are co-financing technical assistance for cardamom producers. So we're bringing money from an NGO and money from a company to 
support improved quality for the producers. And we're also thinking of our own, our own sustainability because by getting involved in the supply chain, we're also going to have a, percent, a small percentage that will ensure that we can keep on giving technical assistance instead of only chasing the next desperate uh, donation to keep on going. So I think that's also important to mention. Thank you. Let's uh, travel to Kenya. <laughs> Wangu, could you please describe a little bit the model that you've been developing? I think it's a very interesting model, increasing both productivity and sustainability of uh, small farmers. And could you explain also how you managed to change scale? Uh, thank you. Yeah, we, we have been, as an organization, working uh, around the Lake Victoria Basin, uh, promoting agroforestry, basically, uh, for close to over 30 years. The shaded uh, place in, 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 the, in the maps is, is a unique project that we have been promoting sustainable agriculture uh, land management practices. And the X up there at the corner is, is a new project that brings in a lot of lessons that we have learned over time. And what we have realized is that um, we have not, in as much as we have engaged farmers in, in learning new techniques, we have at times or more often than not forgotten how do we make these practices long term? How will the farmers continue with these practices even after we have left these areas? And one easy way to do that is to make it close to what matters most to them. How do they make sustainable businesses out of their farms? The lady in the, in the photo there, her name is Cynthia. She lives, um, uh, her and her husband are working on a 0 0.7 acres pi uh, pi piece of land. And from that small piece of land, they are taking care of, of themselves and, and their children and educate their, ch their, their children and take care of their health care and everything. But it, it's a tiny piece and they can only do so much in, given the current situation. If the soils continue degrading, uh, the weather, as we all know, the season, planting seasons, rain seasons, it keeps changing uh, uh, as, as, as we all understand the, the challenge that is there today. It's, yeah, the, the kind of uh, seeds they can access, the, the kind of product, I mean, the kind of harvest that, that they can get from, from their farms. So, like someone said, it, it's, it's hoeing and hoeing all throughout, but reaping very little from from their farms. And how can we how can we do this? We have there are proven ways that that, that have been seen to to change the the situation. Uh, uh, basically, being able, to, for example, to improve the the soil fertility, uh, composting, for example, mulching. It's it's very many easy ways that the farmers. <laughs> Can, can engage in, and uh, that does not cost them much uh, in terms of money, but maybe uh, in, in terms of, of labor at the initial steps. But over time, being able to, uh, to reap more benefits uh, from their farms. And for this particular case, also <coughs> linking uh, the, value, the value chain uh, side of it for, for, for this particular project in, uh, in the Mount Elgon, it's about the, the dairy uh, aspect. So it's a question of how can, uh, for Cynthia's case, she has one cow. So how can that one cow increase the milk uh, so that she's able to get enough for her family and still be able to sell uh, the excess milk? And for that to have a bigger impact, for her to be able to, to get access to, to more services, to engage uh, the business players uh, in the market, then she needs to be a member of a bigger group. And that, that is also easy, it makes it easier also for, for us to engage with, uh, with the farmers. The training are the small, herself and her neighbors, they can uh, uh, be trained more easily when, when they are in a group and several groups coming together to form a bigger cooperative, then they can engage the, the, the big buyers of, of this milk and they can be able to engage and partner with them and secure uh, success, uh, a, a good market at a fair price. And that way, they're not only uh, improving their own lives um, 
in, the, in their own households being able to produce more food, but also engaging in a su successful business so that it's, it's at the end of the day more money in their pocket and they can be able to pay for uh, education of their children and, and all these things. So it's it, like, like it has been said by the previous uh, speakers, it has been a question of how, uh, and, and, and many talks in, in, in many sessions, how do we engage all the players uh, in development? It's the business side, it's the NGOs, it's the government, it's, it's the, the farmers, the people themselves. And for us, th this is really important because at the end of the day, different players are looking at the issues from different perspectives. But if you sit down uh, at the end of the day, it's very many uh, synergies that are created um, in the process. So for, for this particular case at the end of the project, we look to, if you go to, last, to the, next, the next one. Okay, basically we look to increase uh, revenues, to, to increase the, the assets within the farms, uh, and more so also to, to work uh, along with, with empowering the women, the engagement of the women in this community, which is a, a big issue in, in, in the region that this project will be. Thank you, Wangu. <laughs> John, what, why did uh, Brookside decide to join this project, and how do you think? What do you think the impact will be on small farmers? Thank you, Christine, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think we were lucky. We were lucky at uh, uh, having this opportunity uh, to team up with uh, uh, VI Agroforestry and the Livelihood uh, and the Livelihood Program. Brookside is a privately owned company. Brookside currently has 44% market share within the, within, within the country. Uh, we are currently dealing with uh, 145,000 dairy smallholders. And 95%, and in fact, just slightly over 95% of all our milk is produced by smallholders. Um, with their support, we are also able to export milk to 12 countries. But forget about size. Forget about market share. Kenya is, in, is, is going through uh, population growth, for instance. In the next 15 years, our population is going to go up uh, from the current 42, 43 million to 60 million. Where is the food going to come from? So this was a wonderful opportunity to actually target 30,000 farmers that this project is, is, is targeting, seeing to it that the milk that is produced in this area goes up from the current just under 5,000 liters a day to 130,000 liters a day in the, in, the, in, the, in the time span of about four to five years. And in, 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 order, and in order to ensure that this is going to be a success, Brookside will not only provide a market for this additional milk, but Brookside will co-invest. Um, in the auditorium today, we heard about walking the talk. So we, we from, 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 from the Danone CEO, we are doing exactly that. We feel that without sustainable agriculture, that the VI uh, team and livelihood are going to team up with us. We feel that uh, the smallholder, as I heard uh, Manoj saying earlier on, the smallholder is just going to forget about dairy farming and go and do something else. So um, for us, that is the interest. That is the interest about in, in this Mount Elgon area. And we're hoping that the success of this will be the success that we'll probably be able to replicate in other areas, not only in Kenya, but within the region. Thank you. Thank you all. I think it is now time to give the floor to Bernard Giraud, who is the president of Livelihoods and who has some good news to share today.
Good afternoon, uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's quite difficult to talk after uh, such uh, impressive uh, presentations and talks. Uh, what I will, uh, what I would like to share with you today is uh, a very humble but also ambitious manner that we are now <coughs> engaged in the creation of the new fund after five years of uh, um, having experienced the carbon economy with uh, smallholders and rural communities in different places of the world. A few months ago, two companies, Danone and Mars, decided to join forces and create an investment fund called the Livelihoods Fund for Family Farming. We are just at the start and we uh, are absolutely convinced that it will be a long journey, a difficult journey, but we have the ambition to move the lines. So I will share with you the model we have in mind with our partners to move those lines. First, we're, what we are talking about is about reconnecting. Um, the, the supply chain has been broken in a sense. What we call commodities reflects the fact that we buy uh, raw material. Uh, for decades now, we have been buying, as large corporations, we have been buying raw materials, but we ignore where it comes from. We don't know exactly the impact that it had on environment and on the social condition, the livelihoods of the farmers. So the journey we're talking about is about how we can reconnect the supply or the cycle, as Pascal would say. And it's not about reconnection only. It's about reconnection to create more value, more sustainable value, and shared value, what we could call mutual value. The bad news, but it's also a good news, is that today the we are facing uh, inefficiency. If we are a farmer, it's about low yield. It's about uh, farming practices that in many times um, uh, exaggerate, increase the degradation of the soil or deforestation when you are poor, you need more land, you deforest and so on. It's about access to, to, to market, but also access to financial resources no money to invest in anything. And of course, it's about, uh, as a result, about poverty and malnutrition. But if you are a company, the system is also quite inefficient. You're facing issues with volatility. We talked about that. The price volatility, but also the volumes, the traceability, the quality, the supply itself. And if we take now the, the angle of public goods, the general public, the planet, it's the same. It's about degraded capital, natural capital. It's about impact on climate change. It's about social stability, and it's about value for all. So at the end of the day, what we are looking at is how we can turn this vicious cycle in a virtuous or more virtuous cycle. We see in our approach three levers. Three main levers. One is about investment. As Barry said, we need to invest more. I mean, we need to bring more money to smallholder farmers. When I say we, it's the private sector, but it's also the public institution, the government. It's all of us, the different bodies and institutions, private or public, that are involved in uh, working with smallholders. When we say we invest, we say so. We mean, for us, investment mode is virtuous, meaning that when we invest in a project like the Kenyan, run, the Kenyan one that, we, that was presented a few minutes ago, um, of course, the project will have a huge impact on the farmer's revenue, and we hope so, sustainably. But it will create also other types of value. One is the milk that will be delivered to Brookside. And Brookside will be able to contribute financially because they get the milk. But it will also create other types of value. For example, the 30,000 30, farmers 
that will practice sustainable farming will have a huge impact on water resources, water replenishment, underground water, sources, springs, and an impact on, on the Lake Victoria um, Lake and, uh, of course, the, the erosion corridors. So for governments around the lake, such a project has a benefit. It has a value, a financial value. And last but not least, this project will increase fertility. And the tracer of, of uh, fertility, in that case, is the organic content in the soil that will be brought through the good practices of the farmers. And we can measure it. It's about carbon. This project will help sequestrate 1 million tons of carbon in 10 years. So at the end of the day, the model of investment is, yes, we invest, but there is a value back to farmers, but also to the public good. So we expect different kind of what we call off-takers participate to the, to the purchasing of this value. Second, a cooperative, a cooperative approach. We are absolutely convinced that none of us only has a solution. The business will not solve the problem. But the NGO alone will not solve the problem. And the government alone will not solve the problem. So how can we create what we call coalition, but not just for talk? It's not about round table. It's about contractual coalition. For example, in the case of Guatemala, we invested in the project. The project will deliver uh, rubber but also cardamom for the farmers. But the government of Guatemala will participate through a fund on reforestation to protect the upper part of the mountain. And we will get carbon credits. So we invest heavily in a project, and we get money back. With this money, we can reinvest in another project. And cooperation is not just about money. It's about the fact that you have heard uh, my colleagues from different companies, Danone, Mars, a firmenish. They have a very high level of expertise. NGOs like uh, Fundaeco, like VI Agroforestry, like Nandi, have a huge uh, 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 talent and expertise that they have developed with many farmers in the world. So how we can pull that together? Same with research. And third level is the impactful solution. Probably most of the knowledge exists today. I'm sure when I visit uh, Tony uh, Simons in Nairobi uh, with ICRAF, I am always impressed by the program that they are developing. So we have a huge pool of knowledge. The question is how we can mobilize the knowledge from the research, from the NGO, from the business, to put it together and really make an impact. And for that, we have three principles. First is farmers are the key actors. We, as an investment fund, we will not make a change for the farmers. The, charge, the, the farmers will make the change, and we can, in cert, to a certain extent, support the farmers. And when we say farmers, meaning that the human capital, the human investment, the investment in human capital, is probably more important than we call, what we call in business a capital expenditure, capex. In fact, basically, when we look at the Kenya project, VI Agroforestry will invest in the training of 30,000 farmers. They will empower ladies. They will train uh, those farmers to be the part of responsibility in cooperative, in milk cooperative. So it's about investing in people and especially investing in the young generation of farmers because what is at stake in many projects that we are considering is a succession of farmers. Second is good practices but affordable practices. What is great in the three examples we have seen, the one from Nandi in, in, uh, in India but the two ones in Guatemala in Kenya is the fact that what they have developed is something that is quite easy to implement for a farmer at individual level, but also collectively. So it's not about inventing complex solutions or very expensive solutions. It's having very affordable solutions that can have 
very impactful and impact quite rapidly, and then we can replicate it rapidly at a large scale. And last, the landscape. As companies, usually we have a tendency to look at what interests us. So if we are interested in milk, we look at the milk activity of the farm. If it's cocoa, we will look as a company to cocoa. But for a farmer, it's a system, it's an ecosystem. Many people in this uh, audience know that uh, better than me. So how can we look at the 30,000 farmers in the Montelgon area as a landscape with all the consequences and the impact in different directions regarding forests, regarding the lake downstream? For that, we will, uh, we will not start from nothing. Uh, five years ago, we created what we call the Livelihoods Carbon Fund. And from the beginning, we decided to share this fund with other companies. At the time, it was Danone that initiated this fund. But very rapidly, we invited other companies to join this fund. And now, there are 10 large corporations that have invested in this first fund. This fund has invested in nine large-scale projects, seven countries. Uh, the fund has uh, financed the plantation of 130 million trees, impacting uh, 1 million people. And this will result in 10 million carbon sequestrated, million tons of carbon that will be sequestrated, which is a return for the fund. The fund will get the carbon back and reinvest in other projects. And the total of this fund is 40 million. It's not to align numbers, it's not that important. What is important is we have accumulated an experience of relationship with uh, high class NGOs like the one you have seen here. And we have learned together uh, to work together to build trust. We have been facing a lot of difficulty, as you can imagine, hurricanes in Araku, in, uh, in India, and uh, political issues in another country, and so on. But year after year, we have built this very strong relationship of trust that will help face the difficulty in the future. So if you look at the model, we will, uh, we will uh, develop in the coming uh, months and years. First, we believe that we need to invest upfront. We need to bring cash to the farmers, to the project developers. It's too easy to say, well, we will pay you when you, but when you're a small NGO working with thousands of small farmers, you have no cash to start. So we need to provide cash. We need to take a certain level of risk. Second, it's about maxim maximize the value uh, creation for farmers. And it's not just about price. It's about margin. It's about cost. It's about uh, uh, how we can really uh, provide a sustainable revenue to the farmers. And it is not just about revenue. It's about also looking at cash crop. It's about looking at malnutrition. We can increase the cash revenue of farmers, and maybe in a few years, as they have no time for food crops, they will uh, maybe have a, a worse malnutrition than today. So it's about having a kind of comprehensive approach. And then monetize externalities, meaning that if you look at this uh, little scheme, we, as a, as a fund, receive money from large corporations that want to transform their supply chain or their supply cycle. We will invest in projects through project developers, and we are not donors. We have an equal relationship with NGOs. We don't want to be donors. We are not at that stage and they are there. No, no. We sign kind of purchasing contract with NGOs. We provide the money, they provide, for example, the carbon credit or the milk or whatever. So it's a very equal relationship. And we want to do it in the long term. Usually, the contract we sign are 20 years for forestry and 10 years for farming project, 10 years. It gives the time to build, as it was said in the film on Guatemala. And monetize externality, meaning that we need to admit that a good farming project, oh, you're in the dark, <laughs> good farming project provides different types of externalities. But for the government that could pay a part of the impact on water 
the cost is much lower than if the government had to pay for everything because we share the cost. We can share the cost between carbon, water, and milk. So this is the type of model that we want to, uh, to develop in the coming years. So we are just at the beginning of this journey. We, we are very conscious that there will be a lot of challenges, but we are very convinced that this model can work because the first fund has already delivered very well. Now, just to share a few numbers, this livelihoods fund for family farming has a very simple goal, triple value on social, economic, and environmental value for farmers, 200,000 farmers with the money we have today, 2 million people impacted, and we, at this stage, will invest what we have in mind, we'll invest 120 million. Now, I'm very proud uh, to thank our first investors, Mars and Danone. They are not there as financial investors. They are there because they want to transform their supply chain. And I'm even more delighted to welcome newcomers because this fund is not a club for a few. It's something that has to grow, that has to invite other players in the food chain and other activities to come. And I am proud to announce that two companies are now joining the fund today. Uh, the company called Firminis, that, you, um, that Dominique uh, explained to you what it is about, what is their business. It's a world player in aroma and fragrance. But also Veolia, a French company that is a world leader in not only water resources, but also uh, waste management, uh, recycling, and all green activities. And what is important with the coming of those two companies is they will add money in a fund, but much more than that, the expertise. Veolia is managing water 